Hello and welcome back to the Crime Reel. For this week's true crime narration, we shall be looking at three horrific crimes committed in Wales during the 1980s and 90s, and how the perpetrator was eventually brought to justice after many years of relentless police work and forensic analysis. Richard Thomas was a successful 58-year-old farmer who lived in a large house in Scoverston Park with his 54-year-old sister, Helen. Little was known about Richard and Helen's lives, they were very private people. They have been described as shy and kind. Richard was known within the local farming community and it is believed that Helen loved horses. On Sunday, December the 22nd of 1985, the weather had been miserable all day and Richard and Helen were spending the evening at home. The three-storey manor house in which they lived was located in a remote part of Milford Haven in Wales, surrounded by countryside. That evening, a lady by the name of Anna McEwen was driving with her sister-in-law and they noticed smoke coming from Richard and Helen's house. Upon closer investigation, they saw flames coming from the roof of the house and after banging on the door to see if anyone was inside, they drove to the nearest village to telephone for help. The Daffid Fire Service soon arrived, by which time the fire had completely taken hold of the house. Fire Officer Richard Brock could see Richard Thomas on the stairs and managed to drag him out shortly before the roof of the house collapsed. Richard was already dead. Helen's body was found in a downstairs room the following day. After investigation, it was determined that she had been lying on a bed in an upstairs room before the bed had collapsed through the floor during the fire. The fire had been so intense that it was impossible to determine where it had started, however it was clear that the fire had been started deliberately using diesel. Postmortems revealed that Helen had been tied up, gagged and then shot in the head at point blank range. Richard had also been shot, initially sustaining a minor head wound followed by a fatal wound to his abdomen. Police worked on the assumption that the murders had occurred when either Richard or Helen had disturbed a burglar and then the fire was set to destroy any evidence. The Thomas family put up a substantial reward for information and despite over a hundred people working on the murder squad tasked with solving this crime, the investigation went nowhere. Four years later, in the summer of 1989, this peaceful rural community in Pembrokeshire was again rocked by another extremely violent crime. 51-year-old Peter Dixon and his 52-year-old wife Gwenda had travelled from Oxford for a camping holiday at Howlston Caravan Park in Little Haven. Peter was a former RAF flight lieutenant and Gwenda worked as a secretary. The couple knew this part of the country very well having visited on many occasions in the previous 15 years. They were described as being a kind, friendly and compassionate couple with a happy family life. They were due to leave the campsite on the 29th of June but as it was a damp morning decided to have one last walk along the coastal path while their tent was drying out. Three days later, on the 2nd of July 1989, Tim Dixon, their 22-year-old son, became increasingly concerned that his parents had not returned home from their camping trip. He notified police that they were missing. Upon investigation, Peter and Gwenda's car and tent were still at the campsite. Police started a search of the area and at approximately 3.30pm on Wednesday the 5th of July, Peter and Gwenda's bodies were found concealed in woodland next to the coastal path about half a mile from the campsite. The couple had been robbed, tied up and subjected to an extreme amount of violence. Both had been shot in the face at close range with a sawn off shotgun. Peter's wedding ring had been stolen along with his bank card. This card was used to withdraw £300 from a local cash machine and a photo fit and description of the suspect was soon being circulated. Over 6,000 interviews were conducted but after 18 months the inquiry was going nowhere and was dramatically scaled back. Seven years later another brutal crime took place in the same area. On the 6th of March 1996, five teenagers were walking through a field by the Mount Estate School in Milford Haven. They spotted a man walking towards them and as he came closer they realised that he was dressed in dark clothes, a balaclava and was carrying a shotgun. He ordered them to lie down on the floor, firing off a shot in the air to act as a warning to them. 
He then sexually assaulted two of the females, then demanded money from the group before running off. Despite extensive work by the Haverford West Police Force, the crime remained unsolved. The following year, on 2nd of December 1997, Peter and Gwenda's murders were featured on an episode of Crime Watch, a UK television programme which reconstructs major crimes to appeal for the public's help in solving cases. Despite getting an excellent response to the programme with over 400 calls from members of the public, the case still remained unsolved. It wasn't until almost 12 years later, in May 2009, that someone was finally charged for these murders, serious sexual assaults and robberies. This is the story of the life and crimes of John Cooper. John was born on the 3rd of September 1944 in Milford Haven in Pembrokeshire in Wales. When he was 12 years old, he met a girl by the name of Pat, who he would later become romantically involved with. In 1959, at the age of 15, he left school and spent some time training as a carpenter before finding work in the building trade. He would drift between jobs, spending most of his time working as a casual labourer on the farms in Pembrokeshire. On 11th of May 1966, he married his child's sweetheart, Pat, and the following year, their first child was born, a boy who they named Adrian, who would later become known as Andrew. And two years later, they had a daughter named Teresa. Family life was not happy for the Coopers. John was a violent man with an explosive temper. From the age of nine, Adrian would regularly suffer beatings at his father's hand, many of which resulted in extreme physical injury, as well as the obvious mental toll this would have on a young boy. It seemed that John enjoyed instilling abject fear into his son. On one occasion, he forced a shotgun into the boy's mouth and very slowly and deliberately pulled the trigger. Unknown to Adrian, the shotgun was not loaded. Yet to the outside world, John portrayed himself as a fun, charming, sociable person. He enjoyed playing darts, having a drink and was a big gambler, something which he took pains to display the fun side of when outside of the family home. But when behind closed doors, this was far more problematic, leading to violence and money problems. In 1979, John won an Austin Princess car and £90,000 on a spot the ball competition. This would be roughly equivalent to £475,000 today. It is reported that he gave away 10,000 of his win to family members and took his wife on a luxurious holiday to the USA. It is unclear whether their children accompanied them. Upon their return, they bought a small farm where John grew barley and his wife took care of horses. John continued to drink and gamble and by 1982, 15-year-old Adrian moved out of the family home as he could no longer stand living with his violent, aggressive father. John continued to chase the next gambling high and despite his earlier large win, it wasn't long before the family were once again struggling to make ends meet. In December 1985, the murders of Helen and Richard Thomas occurred. John lived less than a mile away and had previously worked on the farm which Mr Thomas owned. It was also reported that he had been known to buy hay from Richard Thomas, often aggressively arguing while negotiating a price. As a routine part of the investigation, John was questioned by police. His family, including his son, all confirmed that he had been at home on the night in question. No further consideration was given to him at this time. John continued to commit multiple burglaries within the local area. In an attempt to win more money, John appeared on the ITV game show Bullseye in May 1989. During his appearance on this darts-based quiz show, he joked with the show's host, Jim Bowen, and even spoke of his love and knowledge of the area where Peter and Gwenda Dixon were murdered exactly one month later. Peter's wedding ring was stolen during the attacks, and when it was found that John had sold a wedding ring on the day that Peter and Gwenda's bodies were discovered, he was questioned by the police. John, however, explained that the ring he had sold was his own, and this fact was verified by his family. John's son Adrian would later explain how John had made the family lie on his behalf, both about the ring and the alibi. But it had been suggested in such a casual way that it seemed almost trivial to them at the time. The armed burglaries continued, 
In November 1996, John broke into the home of Sheila Clark, a local teacher. Sheila managed to press an alarm panic button, and as John fled the scene, he discarded some items, throwing them into a nearby hedge. When police found these items, they started to close in on John. A search of his home uncovered items from over 70 burglaries, including jewellery, picture frames, and over 500 keys. It is believed he kept these keys as trophies. The houses of his family members were also searched and further stolen items were found. In 1998, John was jailed for 14 years for committing over 30 burglaries. He was now on the police's radar for the murders of Richard and Helen Thomas, Peter and Gwenda Dixon and the serious attack on the five teenagers. However, there was no evidence to link him to these crimes. Eight years later, in February 2006, while John was still serving time for the robberies, a cold case review of the murders and sexual assaults was launched. This became known as Operation Ottawa. John Cooper remained the prime suspect. All of the evidence from the robberies which John had been convicted of had been meticulously stored and with advances in forensic techniques there was hope that a link could be made between John and these three serious crimes. It was however a monumental task with mountains of evidence needing to be painstakingly checked month upon month of forensic work seemed to lead to nowhere. Over two years later, in July 2008, when John was fast approaching his release date for the previous robberies, police spent four days interviewing him in connection with the three other crimes. They had already identified that John craved respect and were instructed to let him talk as much as possible in the hope that he would in some way incriminate himself. John continued to insist that he was not a murderer, claiming that people were simply using him to clear old unsolved cases. With no forensic breakthrough, John was released from prison in January 2009 after serving 10 years for burglary and armed robbery. Police were convinced he was a killer and concerned that he would soon strike again. However, after three years of investigation, they still only had circumstantial evidence against him. Shortly after his release, John's wife, Pat, died. Investigators began to look at clothing fibers to see if any matches could be made. A pair of John's shorts which had been kept in evidence from John's conviction were similar to the pair shown in the photo fit of the man using Peter Dixon's cash card to withdraw money. Finally, in April 2009, there was a breakthrough in the case. During forensic analysis of John's shorts, a tiny spot of blood was found. It was identified as belonging to Peter Dixon. It was also noted that during the course of the interviews with John the previous year, he would often refer to a particular shotgun. This gun had already been forensically examined, but in view of John's anxiety about it, it was decided that it should be examined again. The shotgun had previously been linked to John by a screw which had been missing from the gun, which had been found in John's shed. It was noticed that the barrels of the gun were painted black, and when this paint was removed, traces of Peter's blood were found underneath. In his efforts to hide the evidence, John had inadvertently preserved it by painting over it. The police also wanted to establish that John had been the one using Peter's cash card. When the artist's impression was compared to footage of John appearing on the TV show Bullseye just a month before the murders, the similarity is striking. John believed he was untouchable and liked the attention he gained from appearing on national television. Just four months after his release from prison, John was re-arrested on the 13th of May 2009. At that time, police found rope, gloves and an ordnance survey map of the area in the boot of his car. Whether these items were going to be used to complete further crimes, we thankfully shall never know. During police interviews, John was asked to identify the shorts that the police had in evidence from his previous crimes. Believing that they simply wanted to tie his shorts to those shown in the photo fit, he admitted that they were his, unaware that the shorts had also provided the blood evidence. He went on to point out that his shorts were short shorts and as such differed from the longer shorts shown in the photo fit. When police examined the shorts again, they could see that they had been shortened, presumably by John's wife, who had spent time previously working as a seamstress. Inside the shortened hem of the shorts was DNA which matched Julie Dixon, who was Peter and Gwenda's daughter. Police believed that the shorts belonged to Peter, 
and John had stolen them at the time of the murder and kept them for over 10 years as a memento of the killings. During John's earlier 1998 arrest, fibres from his shed matched those found on the balaclava thrown into the bushes near his final victim's house. The scientists now look to match these fibres to those from the three other crimes. Fibres from John's gloves were found in the clothes and underwear of those that had been sexually assaulted. The sewn hem of the shorts and a sock belonging to Richard, which it is believed John kept as a trophy. John's habit of storing items from his crimes and using the same weapons and tools during the crimes would ultimately be his downfall. When questioned about these fibre findings during police interview, John tried to pass the blame onto his son, Adrian, by claiming that Adrian used to borrow his clothes. When police pointed out that John would always blame others for everything that was wrong in his life, John lost his call and became angry and aggressive. John was charged with the murders of Richard Thomas, Helen Thomas, Gwenda Dixon and Peter Dixon, the serious sexual assault on two females, and five attempted robberies in the Milford Haven area. He was held in custody until his trial. The trial began on 21st of March 2011 at Swansea Crown Court. There was indisputable forensic evidence and the testimony of, amongst others, the two who had been sexually assaulted and John's son, Adrian. The trial lasted nine weeks. The jury then took three days to deliver their verdict. On 26th of May 2011, John was found guilty of all charges and given a mandatory life sentence. During sentencing, John repeatedly shouted over the judge, Mr Justice John Griffith. The judge described John as a very dangerous man, highly predatory, who, but for the advances in forensic science, may well have continued to evade capture and that the murders were of such evil wickedness that the mandatory sentence of life will mean just that. In September 2011, John lodged an appeal against his conviction, which was rejected in November 2012. He will remain in prison at an undisclosed location for the rest of his life. That concludes the story of John Cooper. Thank you very much for listening to that. Please add your comments down below. Just as a little bit of information, ITV are making a three-parter mini-series about this case. It's possible it'll be out at the end of this year, and maybe next year. Still to be confirmed because of the current situation. The main stars in it are going to be the Welsh actor Luke Evans and Keith Allen. Thank you so much to Briefcase for asking me to read a story on his channel this week. And if you're a new subscriber, welcome to the channel. Thank you. Thank you once again for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. Psst, if you get a chance, look up the English game show Bullseye. It's a classic show. It was hosted by Jim Bowen, who was a lovely, super smashing guy. Rest in peace, Jim. You entertained us many years ago. Thank you, sir. Thanks again, everybody. Goodbye.